Item number, SCP-11. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. Item SCP-11 and the area surrounding it are to be cleaned once every day. For safety purposes, cleaning should start at least 30 minutes after sundown. Cleaning should always be performed by at least two personnel, who are also advised to note anything unusual about the item or the debris cleaned up. In a situation where the item cannot be cleaned for more than two days, local residents must be contacted and instructed not to approach the item. Note, containment procedures nullified, 2004. Description. SCP-11 is a Civil War memorial statue located in Woodstock, Vermont. The statue is the image of a young male soldier holding a musket at his side, and is carved out of granite quarried within the area. Occasionally, SCP-11 has been observed lifting its musket to the sky to fire at birds which attempt to land or defecate on it. Reports detail that its movements produce soft grinding sounds but do not cause it any structural failure. Oddly, the gunfire is very similar to that of a standard firearm, despite observations that the item only loads granite bullets and granite powder into the musket, which is also unharmed by the firing. In spite of its efforts, some fecal matter does manage to strike SCP-11, and it has reportedly become distressed when it has had a large amount of feces on it, on some rare occasions even firing at humans. Addendum. Those assigned to maintain SCP-11 are to see Document Number 11-1 for instructions. Document Number 11-1 Maintenance Brief Note: Document Archived, 2004 Accessible to personnel with security clearance 2011 or higher. Additional information. SCP-11's seeming sentience has increased since the first report of activity in 1995. As of 2004, the item's containment procedures have been dropped, but it remains under constant observation. Recorded below are landmark events in its activity. Timeline. March 12, 1995. Woodstock resident reports the statue's eyes moving. First sign of activity. September 30th, 1995. Statue shoots musket for the first time. October 9th, 1995. Statue begins shooting birds from the sky. January 25th, 1996. Registration as SCP-11. Containment procedures begin. April 14th, 1997. SCP-11 observed moving casually and looking around. May 3rd, 2000. After caretaker jokingly shouts good shot to SCP-11, the item replies, thank you, in a reportedly very human voice. First speech from statue. October 22, 2001. SCP-11 has conversation with caretaker 2001. Shooting of birds stops. February 6, 2002. At the imploring of SCP-11 steps down from its pedestal. 2003-2004, SCP-11 reaches a human level of self-awareness. November 10th, 2004, containment procedures dropped. Custody of SCP-11 transferred to May 17th, 2005, reports that SCP-11 is romantically attracted to her. August 29th, 2006, most recent psych test reports an IQ of 133. Item number, SCP-044. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. A constant stream of hydrogen ions, unbound oxygen atoms, and other trace-free radicals emanate from the muzzle of SCP-044 at all times. Because of this, the docking stations of SCP-044 are to be well ventilated to keep dangerous gases and moisture from accumulating. Muzzle coverings are to be fitted at all times to keep birds and small animals from investigating the large open barrel of SCP-044. Addendum. As SCP-044 has not been involved in any significant accidents in the years it has been held by the Foundation, SCP-044 has been reclassified as safe. Must I really define significant incidents? If containment procedures and standard safety protocols are followed, 44 appears to be no more dangerous than any other big gun. No, the bear incident does not count. 05 Description SCP-044 is a howitzer, secretly manufactured in the late stages of the Second World War by Krupp engineers. 
personally supervised by Albert Speer, German Minister of Armaments and War Production under Adolf Hitler. SCP-044 is unique not only because of its size, 251,000 kilograms or 251 metric tons, but also because it fires unconventional artillery using an atypical delivery method. Rather than having a breech for loading shells, the rear of the barrel is configured into a massive air compression chamber. Any object or pile of objects that fit may be loaded into SCP-044's muzzle to be used as ammunition. Because of its size, SCP-044 must remain rail-mounted and requires two freight locomotives to move. Researchers believe that SCP-044 weakens molecular and atomic bonds in any material loaded into its muzzle. However, the method by which SCP-044 affects molecular bonds is not known, due primarily to the numerous complex mechanisms that compose the housing and workings of SCP-044. In fact, some mechanisms appear useless and seem to do nothing other than spin or make noise, even when SCP-044 is not supplied with power. Both equipment and personnel have been lost while exploring the inside of SCP-044's barrel. When SCP-044 is fired, all matter within its barrel is ejected at a high rate of speed as a glowing red slug, proportional in size to the amount of mass loaded into the muzzle. Upon striking a solid object or the ground, the slug explodes with a yield proportional to the mass of the original ammunition at no less than a 1% mass to energy conversion rate. The yield will also increase somewhat the longer the slug remains in the barrel. The greatest known yield was achieved when the administrator's 8,900 kilogram or 19,500 pound personal diesel pickup truck was loaded in its entirety into the muzzle of SCP-044 and fired in the pictured experiment. Item Number SCP-108 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-108 is contained entirely by Subject-108-1. Subject-108-1 should be contained in a standard containment cell, measuring 3 meters by 3 meters, furnished with whatever items are requested unless said items compromise security. Subject-108-1 is permitted to leave the room, wander freely, and eat in the main canteen. Medical examination to be performed on Subject 1081 daily. Filters to be changed as necessary. Description SCP 108 is accessible through the nostrils of SCP 1081. Subject is an African American female who was previously employed as a cashier at a small town hardware store in Kentucky. Since SCP 108 has been housed at Site 17. Endoscopic examination of SCP-108 reveals that the area accessible via the subject's nostrils is not the human nasal cavity, but rather a bunker system of Nazi German construction dedicated to the production and maintenance of World War II-era Messerschmitt Me-262 fighters. Exploration via robotic endoscope reveals that the bunker system has internal dimensions of approximately 2 km by 4 km, with a long axis parallel to the main entrance exit portal. While the exploration is by no means complete, SCP-108 is believed to contain hundreds of airframes under construction on its assembly line, as well as three completed aircraft. There is also a large quantity of human remains in the complex, particularly concentrated around the entry-exit portal, with the corpses of Nazi officials, military personnel, Hitler youth, and civilians, possibly Ukrainian slave workers, in an advanced state of decay. Evidence of a firefight near the entry-exit portal supports the hypothesis that the German military personnel were swarmed by the civilians and were killed in the ensuing struggle. Some corpses show signs of cannibalism. Robotic endoscopic exploration continues, and high-discharge LED lighting, assembled piecemeal using the ship-in-a-bottle technique, has been deployed. Endoscopic examination of the interior of SCP-108 reveals a large hangar door area with a kind of double airlock with blast doors large enough to admit two fully assembled fighters. A production line exists which would allow damaged fighters and deliveries to enter on one side of the hangar door, and finished fighters to exit on the other side. Turning the endoscope head 180 degrees reveals the open doorway as an area of total blackness, with two nostril-shaped penetrations in it. One nostril-shaped penetration is connected to whichever nostril is admitting the endoscope, and the other is connected to the interior of a human nasal cavity. DNA testing reveals the nasal cavity belongs to the subject. The black area is impenetrable, 
and absorbs all wavelengths of light that the endoscope can carry. The black area is elastic and yielding when probed. Apparently, the portal system is a unique three-way arrangement. If the outside world is designated A, the interior of the Mi-262 factory is B, and the subject's nasal cavity is C, then traffic is as follows. Anything, including gases and light, going from A end up in B. Items going from B end up in C. Items going from C end up in A. Presumably in 1944, it was intended that C and A were to be the interior and exterior of a double hangar at Tempelhof, based on the architecture of the hangar doors. Addendum 108-1 Subject claims that she was training to perform the human blockhead magic trick in preparation for being a clown at a children's birthday party. After hammering a 4 centimeter long galvanized iron nail into her nasal cavity, she lost her grip on the end and dropped it inside her nose. Immediately, she noticed a god-awful musty stench and experienced nausea and disorientation. Blowing her nose had no discernible effect and left no residue on tissues. She was able to breathe normally through her nose. After about three days, Subject got used to the hell's asshole smell and performed at the children's party to the delight of her nephew. Approximately a week later, after ignoring numerous complaints about the smell of her breath, Subject was diagnosed with pneumonia and placed on a course of roxythromycin. Pneumonia responded to antibiotics, but it recurred a week later. Her general practitioner also noted that nasal examination with an otoscope showed simply blackness, rather than the inside of the nose. After admission to the hospital with chronic pneumonia, Examination with a 1-meter fiber optic endoscope allowed the endoscope to be threaded in almost the full meter. The attending ENT noted that he appeared to be seeing a Nazi eagle badge through the endoscope. Specialist examination notes were kept in a digital patient management system and intercepted by the foundation in a routine sweep. The subject was recovered without incident by Task Force Epsilon 9 disguised as high-risk warrant team officers in a pre-dawn raid in June of 19... By the end of the cleanup operation, the GP, ENT, 11 hospital personnel, and two civilians were terminated. The subject was examined by Foundation staff and provided her with air filtration units, which could be passed through her nostrils piecemeal and assembled like a ship in a bottle. The filtration filling must be removed on a regular basis when it gets expended, roughly once a week, as the subject is essentially inhaling the atmosphere of a formerly sealed Nazi mass war grave. Although initially hostile toward the Foundation, the subject has responded well to enhanced psychological conditioning protocols and now accepts her situation. A plan has been proposed in line with the backing up of all critical Foundation data at Site-62 and SCP-108. Data could be written onto micro SD cards or similar compact non-volatile media and inserted into the subject's nostrils, provided some way to house the subject in a safe location is assured in the event of an XK-class scenario. Research continues to find a way to move the entrance of the dimensional portal from the subject's nostrils to another location, and to discover the physical location of the bunker to determine if alternative access is possible. The original galvanized iron nail has yet to be found. Item Number SCP-186 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures The site of SCP-186 comprising an approximately 300 kilometers squared area, is to be closed to the public under the auspices of a habitat restoration initiative for the European bison. An automated security perimeter is to be established, monitored by staff at Remote Site 355. Security personnel must patrol SCP-186 every two weeks. Any anomalous phenomena observed within the security perimeter must be documented and reported to the research director. All known primary sources documenting the events of SCP-186 have been secured by the Foundation. These materials are to be stored in the Site-23 archives. Due to the age of the materials and the potential for deterioration, all access to these documents must be approved by the Site-23 archivist and handled per their instructions. All instances of SCP-186-1 are to be secured in the munitions wing of Site-23. Description SCP-186 is the site of an unrecorded military engagement, occurring from 7-24-1917 to 8-13-1917, between elements of the Imperial German Army 
and forces of the Russian Provisional Government as part of the larger conflict of World War I and the continuing effects resulting from its aftermath. This conflict came to be known to its participants as the Battle of Husiatine Woods in surviving accounts. In July of 1917, an armed engagement between a detachment of approximately 500 German soldiers and the remnants of a Russian division scattered during the German counterattack to the Kerensky Offensive took place at the location of SCP-186. The forces met in heavily forested terrain outside the town of Husiatin in what is currently Ternopil Oblast, Ukraine. On both sides of the conflict, combatants deployed anomalous weaponry, utilizing technology that is yet to be duplicated or understood at present. This battle eventually resulted in the deaths or permanent incapacitation of all forces involved and approximately 300 civilians in its general vicinity. SCP-186-1 consists of recovered weaponry dating from the initial containment of SCP-186 in 1917 and includes the following. A highly modified weapon resembling the Skoda M1909 machine gun, capable of causing extremely rapid tumor-like growths to appear within the body of any organism larger than a common lab rat. Mortar shells, specially designed to be fired from a Mortier de 58mm Type II, containing a gas that causes animal cells to become unable to cease life function. Concertina wire, coated with an unknown hallucinogenic compound that permanently affects human test subjects upon entering the bloodstream. Remnants of an unknown incendiary device, believed to have been detonated at the close of the conflict, accounting for what is estimated to be 34% of total casualties. British Empire issue number 27 type grenades, containing a gas capable of passing through all tested gas mask filtration systems and causing humans to constantly experience the sensation of being on fire. 8x50mm rimmed French rifle cartridges, containing powdered human bone instead of gunpowder. Purpose unknown. Historical records indicate that the German detachment involved in the Battle of Husiatin Woods, at the behest of a Hungarian military advisor named Matthias Nemes, specifically pursued the group of Russian forces in retreat, which at the time included French scientist Dr. Jean Durand. Based on documents of the era since suppressed by the Foundation, it is believed that these two individuals are responsible for the development and limited manufacture of SCP-186-1 and had attached themselves to opposing sides of the Eastern Front for the express purpose of deployment of these weapons in a combat setting. Research Log 186-7 Notable Anomalies Documented at SCP-186 04-11-1923 a 3 km squared area in the southwestern portion of SCP-186 experiences a spontaneous die-off of trees. Decomposition occurs on an extremely accelerated time scale, and area is completely cleared of trees and other plant life within two weeks. 01-13-1927 Despite temperatures consistently at negative 15 degrees Celsius, no snow is visible throughout central portion of site. Temperatures measured at site are consistent with surroundings. 09-02-1932 The sounds of sporadic gunfire are recorded throughout the site, despite lack of observed presence of any civilians. Sounds persist for three days. 05-30-1936 Agents Chekhov and fail to return from routine patrol of SCP-186. No subsequent traces of either person are ever recovered. 05-15-1941 Acting in accordance with intelligence sources embedded in the Third Reich, Foundation personnel evacuate SCP-186 in advance of Operation Barbarossa. Subsequent to decommissioning observation posts, faint glow visible from 150 meters documented by staff to move through sight. Definitive visual contact unestablished prior to evacuation. 10-29-1945 Containment of SCP-186 re-established after discussions with Soviet Union officials. Upon initial patrol after re-establishment of containment, 13 corpses dressed in uniforms and insignia of the German 4th Panzer Army and 27 corpses in Soviet 22nd Army uniforms are discovered 
in advanced state of decay. No identifications of personnel are successful, as all identifying documents and insignia have been removed prior to Foundation containment. 02 1959 Following the formation of a large sinkhole in the northeastern portion of SCP-186, four men are observed wandering the immediate area in a state of extreme disorientation. Dressed in what are later identified to be severely decomposed and degraded World War I-era military uniforms of both German Empire and Russian issue, subjects detained and routed to Site-23 for subsequent research. 04-02-1959 After an extensive excavation of the site of the northeastern sinkhole, 23 persons are discovered buried, at a depth of 15 meters, in a mass grave. Alive, despite decades of internment and various wounds and injuries. As with subjects discovered earlier, most are dressed in remnants of military uniforms of the World War I era, and are presumed to be participants in the original SCP-186 event. Extensive research at Site-23 yields little information, as subjects are unable to provide any meaningful information or communication to Foundation staff due to extensive psychological trauma and profound mental disorders. Foundation staff attempt to euthanize subjects after three weeks of research, but fail in all attempts. Subjects subsequently tranquilized, anesthetized, and incinerated. 07-29-1962 Prior to upgrades to containment facilities, security perimeter of SCP-186 found to be almost 85 meters longer than originally documented. Inquiry later rules out clerical error as source of discrepancy. 12-13-1975 Localized weather phenomena documented as occurring entirely and exclusively within SCP-186. These include Sustained winds up to 120 km per hour, 20 centimeters of rainfall, and temperatures temporarily reaching 48 degrees Celsius. 08-12-1987 Packs of wolves, numbering an estimated 200 total individuals, travel to SCP-186. Mass at a point in the central region of the site, and immediately disperse. 03-03-2009 a stand of three spruce trees is observed in the southwestern deforested area, the first documented plant life since the 1923 event. Estimated age of trees is 50 years. Transcripts of selected SCP-186 documents. Document 186-3, a flyer advertising a May 1911 lecture given by Dr. Durand to the Royal Institute of Chemistry. To end all wars. A presentation by visiting scholar Dr. Jean Durand, formerly of the Academy des Sciences, on the promise of modern science to create weapons of such terrible deterrent power so as to render future wars obsolete. Dr. Durand shall explain in the convergence of chemistry, ballistics, alienism, and other emerging scientific fields of endeavor that will enable mankind to usher in a new age of peace and modernity. To be given on the 19th of May, Derbyshire Lecture Hall Document 186-11 Opinion piece published in the January 2, 1912 edition of the Hungarian newspaper Nepsava, authored by Matthias Nemes To my fellow subjects of His Highness Emperor Franz Joseph Truly, the greatest of human glories is the unification of a numerous and disparate people into a single, unstoppable purpose. That our marvelous kingdom should embody this inescapable principle should go without saying from Vienna to Budapest. But there are those, both within our territories and elsewhere on the continent, that would see us splintered into a thousand shards and stand in the way of our destiny. What is to be done with such agitators and malcontents? While traitors and radicals are hung properly in the manner of the dogs that they are, there is no execution sufficient to quell the embers of treachery that burn in the hearts of the Balkanites. How are we to demonstrate our unity of purpose, our power, our God-given place at the head of the European procession? By force of arms. The hangman can only strike fear into the heart of dozens. A proper army can strike it into the souls of millions. Perhaps we have the numbers, but in this we are not alone. 
The Russian and the Muslim can rally hordes to their banners, but for all of their masses are merely unruly nuisances. What sets man apart from the animals is not his numerical superiority, no, but his superiority of mind, demonstrated through quick wit and artifice. My fellow subjects, I have dedicated my life to the construction of such demonstrations of artifice that none may stand against my weapons, save the Almighty. It is through the force of superior arms that we will achieve our grand design, both within our borders and without. Give me the factories. Give me the manpower. Give me the chance to serve our empire through my industries. And I will deliver to the people the flaming sword that will light the way to a civilized Europe. It is through these means, and only these means, that we will solve the questions that plague us today. Document 186-32 Telegram sent by Jean Durand to Matthias Nemes from Paris, April 28, 1912 Have considered your proposal. Must decline. Methods inferior and derivative of own research. Your aims are of conquest. Mine are of peace. Regards, J. Durand Documents 186-39 Undated memorandum from General Felix Graf von Bothmer of the Imperial German Army to unnamed subordinates. Effective immediately, Lieutenant Nemes is assigned to your unit as an advisor. Experimental armaments are only to be deployed on Lieutenant Nemes's orders. Despite potential for a breakthrough on the Romanian front, unwise to use these ungodly things until more is known of their efficacy. Rumors of similar developments among the Tsarists remain unsubstantiated. Document 186-52 Letter from Private Pyotr Avtakov, participant in the Battle of Husiatin Woods. Dearest Nadia, I have heard rumors of the madness happening at home. Be comforted that it is nothing like the madness that is happening here. We thought that four years of war had taught us everything we had to know and then more. We learned nothing. The damnable Frenchman that the men elected to lead them spoke of peace. He spoke of weapons so terrible that we could make the enemy surrender on the spot. We were fools. We had run at the trenches with dead men's rifles and sticks in our hands. We believed him, the way we believed anyone that has supplies. We never thought where this man came from. We didn't wonder why he had the weapons he did. We didn't care. We wanted to live. We never considered that the enemy had the same things we did. I do not think the Frenchman did either. Or at least... I hope he did not. I cannot imagine any man who would walk into this knowing what would happen. Maybe the Frenchman is not a man. Maybe he is something else. I am sitting now in a hole I have dug in a forest somewhere. I should have run the second I saw the German take aim at Gilyov. That was no bullet fired at him. I could not look anymore after his face came apart and he was still screaming. I thought I saw hands pulling his head apart. Somewhere in the distance, Volikov is screaming that he can see devils roasting his children. He has been screaming about the same thing for five days. I should have run away so many times. The Frenchman gave us a new gas weapon. We refused at first, remembering what had happened in Romania. But he promised us that this was different, that this would put our enemies down without harming them. Who wants any more bloodshed? He asked us. We could not argue with that. We fired mortars at a position ahead of us. A strange blue gas seeped from behind the trees, but the Frenchman cautioned us against advancing. One more thing, he said. He took one of our rifles, and taking aim, took a single shot. Before we could ask what a scientist could know of shooting, we heard a scream. He had hit one of the Germans. He handed me a pair of field glasses. Take a look, he said. I saw the German missing half of his head still screaming. I have seen everything in this war, but I have never seen faces like those of that German's fellows as they watched their comrade. The Frenchman, in his terrible calm voice, explained that his shot had to have destroyed at least a quarter of the soldier's brain tissue. Enough to cause instant death, he said. But watch. I kept watching through the field glasses. The German didn't stop screaming. At least ten minutes I watched unable to move away. The Frenchman smiled. He smiled at this scene. The gas, he said, ensured that death would not come, regardless of injury. 
The Germans were too horrified by their comrade to notice that they were not behind cover, and the Frenchmen lined up another shot. The rest of the soldier's head was now gone, and the screaming was replaced by some sort of low grunting, the likes of which I have never heard from men. No, the Frenchman said, no harm at all. I have bestowed the gift of life on your opponents. Who could possibly stand against that? He asked. I had to leave and vomit behind some bushes. I had not done that since the first trenches. Who indeed could keep fighting after such a thing? But fight they did. Once, a group of us were ambushed and chased to a meadow. The first men through the trees were hit with something that took their skin. I cannot describe why seeing men blown apart is not as frightening as seeing a neatly flayed corpse on a battlefield, but our group scattered. We are no longer armies. Not anymore. We are animals, trapped in a forest together, uncomprehending. Sometimes, when Volokhov sleeps, I hear the Frenchman in the woods, yelling in Hungarian, yelling and laughing. I would almost rather listen to Volokhov. I am going to die in this hole. I am too scared of what is outside of it to do otherwise. Minkin is going to try to brave the horrors in the woods to escape. I am sending this letter with him, in the hopes that he does. As I gave it to him, he joked that he will get a civil service commission after the war for delivering a letter from hell. I am not certain he is wrong. Goodbye, Pyotr. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.